with something that uh, Mark Cousins said, that how does one take Robin's work forward? Uh, Robin's personality and thought were distinguished by modesty, clarity, and logic. And towards the end of his writings, it seemed increasingly concerned not only with geometry and space, but light itself. And we've been deprived of James Terrell, who would have provided the transition point. James Terrell was uh, studying at uh, Pomona College outside of Los Angeles in the mid to late 60s. Uh, one of his contemporaries is Thomas Crowe, the art historian and critic. But Pomona was also the center for a number of experiments by artists, including Michael Asher and Chris Williams, about whom Tom is going to speak. Yes, I should, I should say at the outset that um, um, I am here very much as a substitute for James Terrell, having um, only been asked a couple of days ago to come. But I, I, I responded you know, immediately and, and uh, gladly to the invitation. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is, is um, begin at a point at least near where uh, Robin Evans's thoughts on James Terrell were going at the, at the, at the end of the, of the uh, section of that essay, which was read before the break. And I want to speak about some, some pieces of art and a certain artistic sensibility that belong at an intersection between visual representation on one side, what we associate with the, the visual arts, properly speaking, and on the other side, the making of space and the use of space. Now, the name of James Terrell is, of course, a central one in this zone of, of artistic practice, but certainly where artistic practice uh, passes over into the construction of quite extraordinary spaces and structures uh, the Roden Crater project of Terrell being only one of, uh, one of a number of these. Now, as Andrew has indicated, my ability to stand in for, uh, stand in for uh, Terrell is uh, partly based on biographical accident, um, our having both been to university at Pomona College, a, a small institution in a high desert valley uh, some 40 miles east of Los Angeles and below the San Bernardino Mountains, where Terrell graduated a few years before me. Uh, that small college was indeed the scene of a surprising amount of advanced artistic activity in the late 1960s. I don't know whether this was uh, the ghost of uh, John Cage, who once was a student at Pomona, lingering on and passing over into the visual realm. The teaching of Maury Baden uh, it was very important and not, uh, I think, sufficiently recognized in the whole development of minimalist performance, post-minimalist kinds of artistic work on the West Coast. Uh, the early formation of Chris Burden, for example, took place at Pomona uh, with Maury Baden in the, late, uh, in the late 60s. And around 1970, just about the end of my time there, uh, the young Los Angeles sculptor Michael Asher was given an installation to do in the small <coughs> college gallery. Now. now, I'm not going to be certain because of the size of these images how visible they're going to be to you. On the left is Asher's own um, laconic <coughs> announcement of the existence of the piece. And on the right, maxonometric um, uh, 
rendering of what he actually did to the space. Now, what you can see most easily is the existing uh, sort of L-shaped gallery as it existed with space for offices and two uh, large galleries, reception and so on, so completely unremarkable uh, small temporary exhibition space. What he imposed on this is, as I say, not probably very visible to those of you from the middle of the room back, is a, a, an hourglass insert which masks and seals all of the existing interior of the gallery. Now I'm going to show you what will be probably comically invisible uh, image here, which is uh, a drawing showing the actual um, L uh, say hourglass shaped structure. Um, I can see it pretty well. <laughs> uh, but maybe I can show you the render the, 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 the photographs of it and it will be more clear if sorry. And we'll go forward here. This is a, a view from the back showing the simple materials that Asher used to effect uh, this interior reconstruction, just simple uh, drywall and studs. Uh, the entrance, as one approached it, looked like this, where you can see the extension of that interior structure protruded through the existing door and in fact made that door uh, uh, inoperable so that this space was always open 24 hours a day. As you came into the entrance, you saw the very narrow waist which joined the, the two existing galleries um, uh, together, but those existing galleries, of course, being invisible. What one saw is this narrow cleft which you could pass through but when you entered the other side, you found yourself, found yourself in a triangular room where the only uh, illumination came through that gap. There was, there was actually nothing inside, nothing that one could see at all apart from Asher's construction. What he accomplished in doing this, among other things, is a neat turning of the hollow minimalist sculpture, that is the work of minimalist sculpture, inside out, so that the interior of a, of a Robert Morris, of a, uh, uh, a Ronald Bladen, the large, dominating, solid-looking, minimal sculpture of the period, uh, the interior of those works became the exterior of Asher's installation so that no obscure inside existed any longer. To accomplish this, the new exterior had completely to coincide with the gallery itself. And the old exterior became well, everything in the vicinity that bore upon the installation and enabled it to take place, the building, the college, the role of that college in the surrounding community. All of these things became the surface of the sculpture. And the crucial detail on, upon which all of this depended was the perpetually open entrance. The narrow waist and the darkness of the second room dramatize the fact that there isn't any light available that that entrance doesn't provide. And it does one other thing as well, which is to interrupt that phenomenological inquiry into space perception and bodily presence, that is the activity which so intrigued the admirers of minimal sculpture. It interrupted that investigation with, sorry, a picture. Framed by the entrance was this idyllic little landscape, a well-watered lawn in the desert, 
studded with palms and eucalyptus, adjoining the house of the college president across the road. Now, for this picture to work, for this absolutely minimal, pared down architectural intervention in the space to produce this picture, it had to have been generated by a method that was impeccably abstract and anti-illusionistic, and so it was. It hovered before the visitor as an enclosed synecdoche of all the conditions that made such a work possible, most of all for the unreal safety and privilege of the environment that allowed this open space, this interior to exist open to the world 24 hours a day and not suffer any defacement, destruction, or real danger. Asher's work in general has shown a capacity to take the existing language of minimal sculpture and make it refer, make it richly referential and picturing, indeed, without altering any of the given terms of minimal sculpture, to make it work against its renunciation of the whole business of illusionism and make not an illusion, but certainly representation, reappear within the ambit of sculpture. What brings me back to it in this particular context and to Asher's work in general is that modesty and extreme clarity of presentation, the grace and parsimony which allows the cognitive and expressive reward of Asher's work to be all the more compelling for the unlikely means by which that significance has been generated. In describing work like this, I find myself testing my own prose for the same values, trying to invest the way in which one talks about art and talks about exemplary instances of visual art in a way that is commensurate with those qualities. Not to add too much complication, not to try to embroider the piece with unnecessary um, uh, signs of virtuosity which belong in another alien community of, uh, of academic expertise. Now, it struck me in reading Robin Evans's discussion of Terrell's light rooms in relation to architectural drawing that his prose very much had those qualities, qualities which are rare in criticism of visual art and I should think in criticism of almost any medium. Well, con to continue in this extrapolation from that point of interruption of discussion of James Turrell, I thought I would do it in this uh, biographical and geographical connection with which I began. Um, the young uh, California artist, Christopher Williams, was a student of Michael Asher's at CalArts, which exists in another high desert valley location. Um, his work, while not in the vein of actual architectural or spatial manipulation, as Asher's was, shows that work in such a vein can generate ideas and practice in other areas of visual production. What Williams has done as he has taken off from his, uh, his uh, student work in the late 70s, when incidentally, actually, he was uh, briefly a student in art history of mine, uh, but I wouldn't want to claim any, <laughs> any um, uh, uh, influence at, at, at all at, at the level of uh, Asher's in this regard, but it's kept me interested and attentive to what he's been doing. And what he has done is pursued a set of rigorous distancing procedures 
in making photographs and then making installations and books and other kinds of arrangements of photographs and texts. His central subject matter, following a great deal of, uh, of sort of theory which has been in the air over the past decade, theory associated with the name of, uh, of, uh, of Michel Foucault, has been the archive. That very, uh, you know, uh, much discussed intersection between photographic traces, knowledge, and power. One early piece of his, which you inadvertently saw a brief glimpse of a few moments ago, took him to an archive where the indexing and display of power are unmistakable. Now, I hope I remember where it is. This one. That is the Kennedy Presidential Library in Massachusetts, where he subjected this archive to his characteristic procedure that is imposing from the outset a simple and rigid criterion of selection from some larger repository of images. In this case, the piece consisted of all the photographs of President John Kennedy taken on one chosen day in the spring of 1963. Uh, with the further stipulation that he should appear with his back to the camera. There turned out to be four prints, three monochrome and one color, which met this criterion, uh, which were then uniformly subjected to an identical regimen of rephotography, enlarging, and cropping. And you see one of the four pieces in front of you. This selection criterion, which Williams calls a filter, transforms the ordinarily radiant center of such portraiture into a momentary void or uh, absence, an occlusion of something that one is looking for. The effect is to signal to the theoretically cultivated viewer that the best theory of the sign is in use, presence being acknowledged as an illusion predicated on absence. While it documents the ordinary efficiency of the publicity of power in that its brief to show the president was so rarely violated, that is the, the images fitting this, this turning away uh, uh, are so rare in scores of photographs which would have been available to the filter. But that highly cerebral awareness of abstract systems of information is unavailable to us without a simultaneous recognition of meaning on the level of historical folk memory. The visible body at the point of portraiture's failure is the body revealed as unaware and vulnerable in the year of its death. The outlaw assassin is the dark follower and product of the publicity of power. The Kennedy regime intensified and relied upon that publicity more than any of its predecessors, only to become its most notable victim. So inscribing the premonition of death into his distanced and impersonal procedures, Williams gives to his historical portraiture all of the real coldness that is common both to his theoretical armature and to his raw material. Now, the topic of political murder has returned in Williams' most recent projects, but with a marked difference in level and scale. One of them, entitled Angola to Vietnam, introduces uh, a topic commonly associated with pastoral, with the bounty of wild nature. These are images which are taken from a collection of glass replicas of botanical specimens that are housed at Harvard University. Now these glass flowers, as they are always called, and you see one of the official Harvard uh, 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 photographs of one of the specimens there on the right, are a magnetic attraction for thousands of ordinary tourists who come to see them every year. But as you can see on the left in a photograph of two uh, eager undergraduates using them in their botanical studies, the actual display of the specimens is markedly unassuming and matter-of-fact. 
the visitor encounters a crowded series of horizontal glass-covered cabinets or um, uh, uh, these uh, vertical uh, displays really laid out for um, uh, tax taxonomic study, uh, each containing a array of what appear to be actual cut flowers, seeds, and pods. It seems, indeed, more the space of a homework assignment than an agreeable diversion. And I've heard it called unkindly the most boring tourist attraction in America. Yet its attractiveness to these crowds, uh, as I say, remains constant. And much of that perennial appeal seems to lie in the knowledge of the artifice involved in the display. That is, all of these specimens are, were the product of a family firm of immigrant uh, craftsmen from Dresden, the Blaschkas, who produced the 847 replicas between 1887 and 1936. They were produced by a father and a son until the death of the father in 95, 1895, then the son carried on alone for another 40 years. And when he died, for all practical purposes, their skills were lost. So the archive is no longer being added to or duplicated. And since the first years of the collection, of extravagant stories have grown around the Blaschka's supposedly secret techniques and almost al alchemical uh, aura of, uh, of, of arcane and lost ancient knowledge surrounds these little botanical items. Well, what Williams has done is to subject the collection to, a, to an initial mental rearrangement that does no disturbance whatsoever to the scientific purposes of the display. He simply reclassified the models from a botanical taxonomy to classification by country. This is just a mental you know, trick he performs. Then he applies a filter which comes from another map of the world, a map provided by a 1985 report of Amnesty International on countries in which political disappearances have been documented. The yield is 27 specimens, which uh, out of the whole, you know, the 847, which he could have uh, uh, used. Um, and he has had those specimens photographed, and the procedure is described here, and is, that description is an integral part of the piece with its absolute objectivity and transparency. Each of the photographs which has resulted from this equipment is displayed with a uh, verbal description limited to country of origin, botanical data, collection indices, and technical specifications of the photograph itself. Now, what I'm going to have to do here, I think to exemplify what I, I hope are the virtues of reticence and modesty, is for an art historian, I think, to do the fairly un unusual thing, and that is to be quiet and simply not say another word until the whole result of Williams's work has passed before you. That doesn't try to reduplicate on the screen the sort of thing one would see moving around the gallery display of the, uh, of the, the residue of Williams's filters. So I will do that now, and I hope create a satisfactory interval or rhythm moving from one to another until we have moved through all of them.
and the last image of the series. Well, as you've seen, the close-up framing of the specimens follows closely the conventions which were used by Harvard's own photographer, the ones designed to heighten the spectacular illusionism of the replicas. But where the official images in sparkling color make the flowers appear vibrantly alive, Williams's choice of monochrome minimizes spurious illusions. And the somberness of the monochrome provides the visual decorum appropriate to a subject of suffering and death. That subdued understatement proceeds from a general detachment and balance which prevails in the piece and which is generally appropriate to a work in the genre of art, some of the lines of which I've been trying to describe this afternoon. Its most abstract characteristic, that is the principle of selection which determines number and interval, is just as appropriately drawn from the realm of international politics in that its material exists because of the, des the desire of an imperious educational institution to exercise a global dominion of scientific expertise. It turns this power to encompass vast space through scientific knowledge into a map of suffering which is identical to the territory it represents. That is, it takes the resources of visual art and returns them to a spatial imagination, which encompasses, first of all, the, the physical space of movement through the building in which the glass flowers are displayed, and then the global geography represented by the map of Amnesty International. And it makes that abstraction vivid by calling on a common yearning for a seasonless natural world that's a place of healing, beauty, and abundance. Because the glass flowers exert their power by standing as tokens for this redemptive wish, for being a deathless glass garden in the min middle of a New England winter. What is imagined as a lost art approaching alchemy has conjured life from an inanimate substance. By virtue of that substratum of feeling for the flowers, the abstraction that defines the piece at the same time concretely figures a triste tropique where the murderous denial of such longings and all the most modest desires for everyday human fulfillment are routinely uh, uh, permitted and encouraged in our name by those who rule us. And that map is, of course, mocked by the absurd map in color, the absurd map of international humanity, which concludes the piece. But to return to the character of the images of the flowers themselves, Williams's photographs pay straightforward attention to the, uh, to the breaks, to uh, the damage which the flowers have suffered over the years. I don't know whether it's probably most visible in this image, but I don't know whether it will be getting across to you where you sit. And this is, interestingly, the one that appears twice. This attention to the breaks and damage done to the flowers points up an aspect of popular fascination with them that runs in the opposite direction to the illusion of permanence. The literature for visitors concentrates on their fragility, their susceptibility to accident and abuse and catastrophe and permanent extinction, as evidenced in this photograph um, of, the, of some of the flowers being taken away for exhibition elsewhere and the chosen method of transport um, was the funeral hearse, uh, I gather because they are exceptionally well sprung. 
In that literature, the circumstances which led to each law, led to the, 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 the loss of each flower which has been broken, and there are several which have been permanently, you know, permanently uh, disappeared, uh, are carefully explained as if, as if the loss of each one needed to be justified to the people who come to see them, clearly responding to the preoccupations and inquiries of the lay audience, literature makes the glass replicas seem more alive than their natural reference, more alive in that they, like human individuals, cannot be replaced. Their reception is already marked by an imagination of human suffering and death, an anthropomorphizing empathy to which high theory, from which we began, is normally hostile. Engaging the success of Williams's Angola of Vietnam, I find myself recalling an old and resonant remark of Clement Greenberg's when he said in 1947, the best visual art of our time is that which comes closest to non-fiction, has least to do with illusions, and at the same time maintains and asserts itself exclusively as art that Williams has fulfilled the terms of that demanding dictum in ways, of course, that Greenberg himself would probably never endorse, comes in no small part from his, his uh, uh, belonging to a line of succession, um, a mode of art incubated within a particular avant-garde characteristic of Southern California in the late 60s. Because I think very much the same could be said of Michael Asher. And it's that, it's that uh, setting which incubated James Terrell and produced an art on the verge between the visual and the architectural which attracted Robin Evans. The logic and order of each of these pieces, that which gives it, them their identity as art, is drawn from a world of large, high order. The global, the, the furthest extent of the social and economic, that one pole uh, of uh, abstract knowledge to which he referred in the essay on drawing. There Parsimony and reticence incorporates a realist's recognition that the power of art to command attention and resources on a global scale is so great that any intervention in the system beyond the most minimal is likely to become a redundant, obfuscating embellishment of false subject subjectivity. Each piece accepts that system on its own terms. Each piece manifests an Apollonian economy of gesture and abhorrence of vulgar excess. Yet that modesty of authorial presence, while retaining an unimpeachable elevation, finds crucial common ground with the immediate, the everyday, the matter of fact, the genuinely anonymous, as lived and experienced by the people who come to see the glass flowers and are drawn by that substratum of feeling that they embody. Each work, by virtue of its restrained attachment, frames the unpredictable vernacular uses of its material, the imaginative transformations already effected out in the world over historical time through thousands of unremarked individual transactions. The museum visitors, in this case, themselves continually arranging the material into patterns of cognitive response and emotional response, which the artist exploits but cannot himself any longer create or impose. So in thinking about that essay over the last two days and thinking about these pieces which Andrew encouraged me to, to bring to the attention of this audience, it seems to me that there is in this a going on from the dilemma posed in Robin Evans' essay on drawing in a sense that his attention to, to, to James Terrell was an attention to a, a place where further practice could proceed and uh, I thought it would be an appropriate thing to at least sketch one line of that going on which, uh, which these artists have effected. So thanks very much for, for your attention this afternoon. <laughs> Hello.
Christo is still sitting in the back and will come forward. Um, I don't think I'm alone in seeing the parallels and echoes of Robin's reticence and modesty in description of the visual arts in Thomas Crowe's talk and writing. Um, in thinking about the future, I also remembered that Robin must have made his work in long hours of solitude at home, and through those 20 odd years of making that work, maintained his integrity when he might have been living a more comfortable life uh, as a permanent lecturer. And also in thinking how one might go on, one remembers this is a college and that we are three colleges met together in this room. So there are students taking on that work, making work. And I remember Tom saying, if I can paraphrase it, it's all right us writing about stuff, but we can't write anything unless you guys make it and do it. Um, and I was trying to think of who might, as it were, echo that as a visual artist, the long hours of making work, something that might take 10 or 15 or 20 years to realize. And uh, I thought of Elliot Bristow as the, as the greatest example of this, who, uh, well, he will explain the, how it came to be made. But what exemplifies Eliot is the, his own modesty, his acute awareness of the visual, as a man, I think, who notices absolutely everything. And also someone that I get from the work who lives from day to day and from minute to minute, who treasures other human beings, his friends, and those he comes across in his life. And all that is incorporated in his great work, which has been at last shown after 20 years by Channel 4. Probably one of the greatest films ever made, really. Something called Road Dreams. Elliot. Thank you. Well, it's obviously after that background very hard to know quite where to start. But I wanted to make it quite obvious also that I don't, in fact, and uh, happen to have ever come across uh, Robin Evans, and the world of architecture is not a world I know much about, other than the fact that for large, or not some portions of my life, I've lived in very small places, and cars, and garden sheds, and cupboards, and things like that. So I've got an awareness of space, <laughs> at least from that. And the only Italian I ever learned was, in fact, or vacui, which I understand means dislike of emptiness in small spaces. But uh, coming on from that, I, though I have no direct connection to your world of architecture, uh, the theme, which I understand brings you all here today, of course, is the fact that Robin Evans was cut down, just like that, in the middle of what was beginning to be a very fulfilling, or not the middle, the start of a very fulfilling period for him. And all I can do in this particular situation is possibly tell you a little bit about the life I've led, uh, feeling a bit diffident about it, of course, because obviously what I've done, I've done simply for myself, and it's had a purpose to me, and hope from that, especially to those of you who are students, that the theme of working on a project, something that's specific, that which you stay close to, come what may, and the come what may is usually negative and disappointing, uh, is a theme that at times is uh, necessary to, to reflect on. And I understand from talking to other people here today that was very much part of the affection and the feelings about Robin Evans is that he was an individual who did that. Making other comparisons between myself and him is not really, I would feel uncomfortable about that. But what I've done is really, uh, for about now 25 years or so, is kept a diary. And uh, I've kept it with a Super 8 mute film camera. I mean, now, of course, that's a very... Uh, almost a very obsolete form, but I still do it because for personal and technical reasons I find that uh, video as yet doesn't equal the warmth of film.
But that's my background, and that's what I've been doing on and off over that period of time. And it's probably no surprise to hear that the world of television and the world of film has been uh, quite disinterested in it. But uh, it has actually led, and that's part of this theme, is that this particular obsession with an individual project did learn, lead eventually to Channel 4 putting up the money to turn it into a, a series, a six half hour series, which is uh, my connection with Andrew is that he saw it just recently in its third transmission on Channel 4. But the beginning of it for me is that in my adolescence, and we all have various forms of that, is a family saying that my, my father used to come up with, and you normally come into sort of rock hard collision contact with when you're an adolescent is if you've got the time, you haven't got the money, and if you've got the money, you haven't got the time. And uh, ever since then, I've been trying to uh, crack that riddle, and uh, not with any great degree of success, but how I've approached it is, in fact, is through, obliquely perhaps, but I've approached it through driving. And I find that driving, for me, is the closest I can get to that state of making that balance work. So that's a large part of what the series and the diary is about. Road Dreams is about essentially leading a life on the road. And it is, in this particular case, Road Dreams, that section of the diary, I've kept it subsequent to my return to England, but is about living in America and living on the road in America. And I'm one of those people who read Jack Kerouac's On the Road, a large number of my generation did, and I think it's still fairly popular. I read it in 19... Uh, 58 first. I went to America in 1968, 10 years after that, and on the road gave me a very romantic sense of America. And in that sense, I'm relatively lucky or even blessed to be one of those people who actually was able to live out his fantasy and not have it crumble in the actual experience. In fact, the, the life I led was everything I could have believed. Uh, the, the first experience of arriving in New York is that it was like coming out of the movie theater and finding that the film was still going on outside in the street. And that's, that was my reaction to America. And so what was intended as initially as a two-week holiday through a series of slender threads uh, became 14 years away and led to developing this, this obsessive uh, form of diary keeping, which has finally come to that, some form. So I arrived in America uh, through these slender threads that I talked about. I was mugged. Uh, it turned out to be extremely fortuitous in as much that at that stage, and I think it's probably still true, on for other vanities and the like, that the New York judicial system was that as I was a material witness, the, the uh, mugger was caught through some strange accident, and as I was a material witness, I stayed on for a whole, uh, a whole year waiting to be a material witness to the grand jury by which time I knew that I didn't want to go back. And what I had been in England, and is quite important in the sense of not considering myself directly a filmmaker, more of a diary keeper, and back to the theme of driving, is that I consider myself as much a driver as I consider myself a filmmaker. I had been, I wish I could sort of be uh, grandiose about it and call myself a truck driver. I'd been a van driver before I left to go to uh, America. And that pleasure in driving around that I mentioned to you earlier on had always been there. And it was as true then in America. And so what happened is through this lucky accident of being mugged uh, and realizing that I wished to stay on, having had a year to learn how to operate, this was in New York, realizing that though I would have to become an illegal alien, uh, a wetback, that there were so many of them, the chances of getting caught were, were quite uh, remote. And so that led to me staying on in New York through once again slender strands, finding a job quite accidentally, but with a small outfit at that stage of the game called uh, Channel One. This is of course some time ago, it's 1968, and it's the era when alternative uh, television, as it would have been called then, or the term underground, which was very fashionable then, uh, applied to anything that didn't fit. And I happened to fall in with a group of people uh, uh, who had gone to the Bard College and had turned their hand to a video, um, a really what one could only call a video review. It was called Groove Tube. It was later turned into a film. And uh, they had a little theater on the uh, Lower East Side. This is in the days when the, the Fillmore East was operating in, in that particular period. So I started working for them 
and once again, the way these things work, this show became popular. It was uh, unlike anything you could see on television in those days, but it was also the era, it might seem hard to believe now, it was also the era, of course, when if you had video, a video presentation, you had to physically turn up and, with the video deck. It was black and white and reel to reel. I mean, video cassettes in that sense didn't exist, and it was this particular era. It lasted a very short time, but I, their show was popular enough to go around what is in America very well established, the college entertainment circuit, and I was the natural, uh, the natural choice in such a small organization. The person who, who I replaced was, incidentally, Chevy Chase. This was his start in, uh, in the world of entertainment. Uh, but I was, in that sense, uh, I won't say more expendable, I was less valuable, but in a different sphere, and I was therefore paid to drive around America for two and a half years. That's obviously a slender strand that uh, worked very much in my favor, because uh, as an illegal alien, to get a job where you're paid quite well to travel all over America is, uh, was obviously a very, very lucky accident. But the theme of slender threads and what a diary reveals uh, by keeping a diary helps put some spotlight on those and how they're useful, accidental, and whatever, is, for this audience, is possibly best uh, noted by saying that there's uh, my contact uh, with the Architectural Association is through Andrew here, and he called me up, I have to say, after having seen, um, seen Road Dreams. And uh, I've seen some of his work, and Slender Threads again, I've seen one of his pieces called 100 Oleander Trees. Uh, I've not met Andrew until today, and there's a very good chance from looking at uh, one of those hundred images that he has a photograph of my car in Los Angeles in 1976. So, though that might not have any moral bearing or anything, it does, in fact, underscore, in fact, how much slender threads do work. And in the case of Robin Evans, as I say, I don't know him and don't know his background, but I understand the, the power and the affection that he, uh, he created from the large turnout of people who come and the long distances many people who come here today to, in that sense, remember him, is that I understand about him is that he did, in fact, very much hew his own particular uh, path and stay with it, despite the difficulties that that set up for him. And I can't say that there's a direct uh, lesson for individuals in this room to learn from that. That wouldn't be my place. But uh, it is the theme of maintaining a particular project, and that's what I found for myself, what a diary does. Um, I very much in this uh, instance bought through a, a fair degree of just uh, becoming um, uh, extremely obsessive, uh, bought uh, a, a very uh, maverick project to a form in the business of television, in the hard-headed sense of the word that the business has to spend quite large sums of money. And because of that, I've learned in my case, the value of just persevering. Now that also goes on because the project itself has now been shown uh, for, uh, it's had three transmissions on Channel 4. And at this point, I have another project. I continue to drive. Uh, in fact, I've learned uh, another, uh, another word in the foreign language, German. I think it's pronounced Farnewugen, and it translates as joy in driving. And uh, I still have that. I now have a three and a half ton uh, Renault Master van, and I do a little bit of light haulage work, which takes me, I take things like satcoms to Antibes and I go to tents to Dusseldorf and things like that on occasion. So I'm still able to incorporate a lifestyle that throws up a lot of, uh, lot of imagery for a diary. It would be much harder to maintain a diary over this period of time. I wouldn't want to, to uh, dismiss it if I would say the manager of a Kmart in uh, St. Louis or somewhere like that. Uh, it has got a lot to do with, in fact, moving about. So what I thought I'd tell you briefly is the background of the diary for where it's relevant, and um, just follow through from that. And it is simply that I arrived in America, as I told you, in 68, spent those years. Um, after the two and a half years of being a video roadie, which was a, 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 in an industrial hall of not so much fame, but an industrial hall of... Uh, realities was a, a job that only lasted, as I say, two to two and a half years, the definition, because after that time, video cassettes were sent out. And I had accumulated with a Super 8 camera uh, about, during the two and a half years, I was paid by the Channel One people to travel around, 
had accumulated about 23 hours or so of just footage, lots and lots of footage. I mean, as I mentioned to you, it was like being on a movie lot, and obviously if you're on a movie lot, the instinct is to film it. So that's what I did. I found at the end of that time that when the, the Video Roadies uh, Groove Tube Channel One job came to an end, that of course I was desperate to stay traveling. And as an illegal alien, it wasn't that easy to find some other job that fitted the bill. So I was almost forced by necessity into putting form onto this uh, rather random collection of film. And I, with a friend in Iowa City, uh, turned it into a four screen film. This is also back in the days, of course, not so much long since gone, but a lot, a lot less likely these days, when people would turn up. The travelogue was still, uh, the person who had ridden the Trans-Siberian Express would keep a, a record of it and go around the church hall circuit. That sort of world still existed. And I was able to put a form of this footage into a four screen film back in the days when a travelogue was a, a term people understood in the sense that you turned up physically with your work. And from that point on, I was able to scratch a living for quite a few uh, years, going around the college entertainment circuit, getting paid to turn up and show this film. But as, of course, I went on traveling, I went on shooting further footage. And in this particular instance, every two years or so, I would have a fresh amount of footage. Uh, as a rank outsider, I was, of course, forced to deal with the original um, original film, to cut it, to, to view it, to use it, which in a filmmaking sense of the word is not a very wise thing to do, but was forced on me by necessity, and uh, found that by doing this particular, bringing the film up to date every two years, that um, I could in fact just keep my circuit going on and on, because like our lives, it was, to somebody who might have seen it two years previously, it was familiar, and yet it had further, I wouldn't want to call them accretions, but it had further imagery, fresh imagery from the two years of my life. So I found that there was a consistency to it by maintaining, just maintaining the diary. And if there is a theme, various names, I can sort of, not that they're known to me personally, but George Lucas, a man with a certain amount of heft in the film business, uh, I did read an article about him once where he uh, said that his real ambition was to make a film that uh, was never finished. So if we're to say that I'm doing what George Lucas would like to do, that's uh, one, uh, one aside to it. But really, it meant that I had a form to keep on traveling. And I did that right through to about 1980. Um, but even, I mean, having gone to America for two weeks holiday, even 12 years, I mean, you have to face the fact, uh, it wasn't a life of holiday, obviously, but one has to face the fact, where does this take one? And, and at that stage in my early 40s, uh, it became sort of the usual pressures and, and needs and responsibilities to come home for family reasons. So I came back and I came back with 75 hours of mute Super 8 film. And the other part of this, which I suppose without knowing Robin Evans, but the other part of this that may have some validity, I would think, not knowing the world of architecture, but I would think that some of the pressures that apply in the film business are probably as applicable in that. I would well imagine that there are far more of you than there are opportunities to execute architecture. And it's also true in the world of film, of course. There are, everybody wants to direct, anybody who's interested in film, and there are very few people who are going to get that opportunity. So I came back in that sense, though, uh, a man in my, at that stage of the game, in my middle 40s, uh, with, with 75 hours of film um, and very little else. So the remaining seven years, and this is applicable, I think, at the theme of persevering with something, uh, and I don't, as I say, back to Robin Evans and the theme of his perseverance, is that I was then facing trying to turn the project into form in the sense that I had to get even Super 8 film. Uh, if you want to turn it into television, uh, you must raise a budget. I mean, it would be way beyond myself. So I spent seven years doing that. Some of the experiences are probably ones you've had yourself, typical, or, or we we assume that they're fairly typical of the abuse uh, and the humiliation that one suffers. I've learned as a personal aside to always stay polite, but uh, I suppose the incidences that come to mind are going into the producer's office, you've, you've fought for this interview for probably about six months, you're just going to show them five minutes, they put the uh, videotape in the, uh, in the 
uh, video off the video player in their office and then start it and then go out to make the coffee and come back three minutes later then you're faced with those sort of dilemmas and do you stop it do you sit there watching it yourself and just carry on and those sort of things I, I had a period when I was first mounting it when I put together what I thought was a rather snazzy little brochure trying to raise money production money and uh, of the various outfits I sent it to I sent it to CBS and bombastically or not I used on the front uh, this would be in the early 80s I used on the front uh, Road Dreams the name of the program is the video version of Jack Kerouac's On the Road a bit of an attention getter and so I got a letter back from CBS about the usual sort of several months later saying dear Jack, Car dear Jack Kerouac uh, we uh, like the idea of your work but there's no place for it with us and those range of uh, anecdotes and we all have a store of them but that's the nature of what I was uh, dealing with but back to the randomness which may I think and I hope be applicable for all of us regardless of uh, what's happened with Robin Evans is that uh, I persevered in many ways of course I was lucky because there was uh, I'm totally unemployable uh, outside of this particular sphere so I had no choice but to do this but I persevered uh, was able because I'm a Bristolian through a very lucky random connection to a friend meet somebody who was a director at HTV the local Bristol television station uh, a half hour program was um, made what I have discovered in any project any long term project and I'm sure this is true especially I would imagine with getting a building pardon the pun off the ground the project is that um, what happens is that every stage you go forward uh, thinking that that reaches some sort of realization or conclusion getting over a hurdle just simply reveals the next higher hurdle that you couldn't see from the previous hurdle and each one of them of course is a sudden death uh, hurdle if you don't get over it the project's dead despite whatever work you've done uh, in this context the program for HTV was a half hour version of what I'd done uh, the hurdles there were things like that um, and that's this stage 1984 uh, the ACTT, the, the television union, um, had the right to veto work that hadn't been done by their union members. And uh, because I hadn't had a union crew with me for 14 years on the road around the states, uh, the project almost didn't get off the ground. It had to be put to a vote, and luckily my uh, producer at HTV was extremely silver-tongued and persuasive. But those are the sort of uh, project uh, of, of hurdles I, I mentioned to you just because those are the things one needs to persevere on and on and on with. Uh, I eventually, with this half hour program, uh, was able to send that around, was able to interest, uh, um, once again, through the slender connections, uh, able to interest Naomi Sargent, who is the uh, commissioning editor for education at Channel 4 at the time. Uh, the process took about, I think it took about three years from initial interest uh, to actually having the completed money uh, or the completed go-ahead to have uh, project money and from I mean the incidents that come to mind there one stage Jeremy Isaacs it was necessary for him to okay it Road Dreams doesn't fit any of the normal television definitions and television is a business that likes to have its very clear definitions what slot is it going to fit and Road Dreams doesn't really fit that so it became necessary for him to okay this uh, there was a year of waiting with really nothing else much going on at all in my life. Um, I finally uh, plucked up enough courage to go to a meeting where I knew he would uh, be and buttonhole him, which is not my personality at all. And uh, uh, as ever, there's always a rational reason. Nobody had uh, been Bristolian and been somebody who's not involved in the business. It wasn't known to me that the man's wife was dying of cancer. You know, they had enough on his mind. Uh, to his credit, I will have to tell you that when I buttonholed him at this meeting, he knew what the project was, which I find quite extraordinary, given the man was running a major television program, a major television station. Uh, there was that. Uh, it still lingered on. Um, Naomi Sargent expressed some interest, but it didn't actually seem to be going anywhere. I couldn't get any response to that. I was working in a crew agency for two pounds an hour uh, in my mid-40s, really just just trying desperate scams, trying to sort of work out this and that. And through this, the slender threads again, I got a job as uh, basically a gopher on a shoot. Uh, I had at one stage, um, it was a, uh, a Channel 4 series about the discrepancy in uh, magistrate sentencing, uh, um, and uh, not a subject I know much about, but I was, as I say, just a gopher. And uh, the shoot, because it involved 
a certain amount of, uh, not controversy exactly, but um, uh, then I think it was uh, Lord Helsham was then the Lord Chancellor. Uh, it had some controversy in it. So Amy Sargent, who was the commissioning editor for this programme, had cause to come to where we were shooting a magistrate's conference in Birmingham. And uh, we were introduced as the crew. I didn't really expect her to recognize me. She did after a little prompting and said, oh, I've got the money for road trees. And it's as slender as that. It's as slender as that. And really, that's then led on to the actual production of it. That was in itself for me um, a, a major period producing a, uh, producing a television series and I've never done it before it was very instructive if there are any elements of pride it is in the fact that I was able to do that on my own from basically an attic room uh, but it has seemed to work it's come through in that sense to a particular uh, conclusion whether or not the new project which I tentatively call Eating the Wind which is the one about driving around Europe whether that will actually come to form is just as questionable. In fact, I've learned that uh, even though the old Hollywood expression is that you're only as good as your last movie, and Road Dreams did get excellent reviews, uh, it's not necessarily true. So I'm in this case faced with the fact that uh, what I consider the prime focus of me leading a life that has some purpose to me is as subject to the vagaries of acceptance as ever. And I suppose in this particular instance of today, really, I would tell you that I intend to persevere. That may or may not be of interest, but that's what I intend to do. Uh, it may come to some conclusion in the positive sense, or it may not. But really, it has to do with the fact that we've all come together today because, in fact, of Robin Evans and his work and who he was. And though I, as I say, never knew the man, I would like, as it were, as my closing comment, to say that he must have had so much of that sense of perseverance about him that you've all formed, and I take it from the conversations I've had, you've all formed the positive, and in fact in some cases, loving sense of a man and who he was. So this day is really Robin Evans' day, as we all know, and our thoughts are for what he did, and thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Before John Bold sort of closes the day, perhaps one should read from the piece that Elliot always closes the road dreams with, which is, of course, unknown to uh, the men at CBS by Jack Kerouac. And I can't read it as well as Mark Murphy. And I'm going to change one word with Elliot's permission and I imagine Jack Kerouac's. It goes... We passed Las Cruces, New Mexico in the night and arrived in Arizona at dawn. I woke up from a deep sleep to find everybody sleeping like lambs and the car parked God knows where because I couldn't see out the steamy windows. I got out of the car. We were in the mountains. There was a heaven of sunrise, cool purple airs, red mountainsides, emerald pastures in valleys, dew, and transmuting clouds of gold on the ground, gopher holes, cactus, mesquite. It was time for us to drive on. Thank you. As a Raymond Chandler fan, I won't follow that. I just want to um, bring people up to date with where we are with Bob's work. And he was putting the final touches to the manuscript of um, Projective Cast when he died, subtitle of which, Architecture and its Three Geometries, the three geometries being compositional, projective, and signified, this might be familiar to all those of you who have been fortunate enough to hear the lectures um, which have preceded this, um, but you won't all be in that happy position. I certainly wasn't. 
Um, I'm acting as a, as, as a reader, not, not a reader giving approval, but a reader checking footnotes and correcting idiosyncratic spelling. Uh, uh, there's a lot of it. And um, I feel immensely privileged doing this and tremendously excited about this book. It's a very rare intellectual tour de force. It's beautifully written with the kind of startling perceptions um, which students will be invited to discuss uh, to their horror, in the words of the examiners, for years to come. I share with um, all the others who are involved in this enterprise not only these very positive feelings about it, and not only the great sorrow at his death, but also great annoyance with him for going off like that at such a moment of imminent triumph. It's not overstating the case to say that from my perspective, that of rather parochial British um, architectural history, but it's one of the most brilliant book works in the history of architecture that we're likely to read. It's too dense, too complex, and far too intelligent to be summarized here. And um, anyway, I wouldn't be the person who would be overweening enough to suggest that I could do the job. What makes it remarkable isn't just the range, but the grasp of many disciplines which enables that range to be compassed. We go from Wölflin, Wittkover, and Raphael's centralized church at St. Eligio to Gordon Matter Clark shooting out the windows at Eisenman's Institute, um, back to Piero della Francesca's heads, onto the stereotomy of Philibert de Lorme and Guarino Guarini, the systems of proportion of Claude Perrault, and comic lines of Corbusier's Ronchon, to arrive at the unifying diagram um, which closes the book and advertises today's event. He closes on a rather downbeat note, after all the pyrotechnics, leaving the reader with the profound feeling of there being more to come. The book's ostensibly concerned about the truth of geometry. Is the geometry in architecture so reliable? It's difficult to say where it is exactly. Reports come from several locations. We're concerned here with the distinctions between the Euclidean geometry of ratios and equalities of lines, areas, and angles, which can be applied like templates directly to a material, and projective geometry, which is a geometry concerned not with measuring the intrinsic properties of objects, but one predicated on the perception that while figures deform according to the point of view, lines of sight do not. So rigidity is transferred from objects to the medium of their transmission which is most easily imagined as light, and some earlier speakers have referred obliquely to that light. Metrical geometry is a geometry of touch because congruity of figures is assessed by whether they feel the same when put together, while projective geometry is a geometry of vision because congruity is assessed by whether they look the same from a different standpoint. And this enables us to see why architectural composition is such a peculiar enterprise a metric organization judged optically, and it mixes one kind of geometry with the other kind of assessment. Bob concludes his introduction by saying, I never intended, he doesn't actually conclude it, but it's a concluding sort of remark, I never intended to write a summary history of geometry and architecture through the ages. It could be argued that the most intense interaction between the two subjects occurred during the 17th century which is touched on but not dwelt on in what follows. Instead of a synoptic survey, I chose to concentrate on several quite specific kinds of interaction, often focusing on individual buildings to do so. The scope is largely confined to Europe from the 15th to the 20th century. Coverage is limited and incidental, but it is not intended as accidental or arbitrary. An episodic treatment of this sort has no advantage unless the episodes intimate something other than the fact of their own unique occurrence. I've sometimes tried to indicate aspects of this extra intelligence quite clumsily, but my hope would be that the reader might more easily gain in the reading what I have been unable to state as conclusions in the writing. And I say this not to exonerate myself from the task of generalization, but merely to express the hope that it will be a book like so, so many others I have read. This isn't a book like so many others that we have read. It's certainly not like any other book that I've read. We've all read books before about Raphael and the centralized church,
But how many ask the obvious and hardest questions? The obvious question, where is the center of a centralized church? The point on the floor beneath the dome, is it at eye level above that spot? Is it the monstrance on the high altar, which could be regarded as the liturgical center? Is it at cornice level, which could be the volumetric center? Is it the point in the drum where all the light converges? Is it the geometrical center of the dome? Is it the ring of the oculus, of the zenith of the dome? Is it the cap on the lantern? Or is it the orb on the pinnacle outside? We've got nine options. They all mean different things. Which has preeminence? And again, we've all read books on Renaissance proportion and the relationship of that proportion with musical harmony. But here again, we're brought up short. There's one quite effective way, Bob points out, to change our understanding of the relation between Renaissance music and architecture. Instead of comparing architecture to musical theory, compare it to musical practice. We're then launched into a rather dazzling discussion of the structure of isorhythmic motets and their allied mensural techniques in relation to Florence Cathedral. Um, and this is coming from a non-musician. He is, he wrote, he was, he wrote, not so much concerned with answers as with what the questions indicate, traveling hopefully, you might say. Um, but he's being disingenuous, and he knew it. Answers are supplied. Alternative answers are supplied, too. Despite the range of subjects and the diversity of exemplar, the innumerable insights which distinguish this book from other books which Bob might have read is its traditional values which cause it to excel, the sorts of traditional values that Raphael Monet was referring to earlier, its analytical rigor, its honesty in dealing with the evidence, and its undeviating search for the observable. Just as in the AA Files article, which was uh, the beginning of which was quoted from earlier, which goes on to discuss Philibert de Lorme's chapel at Annette, and I'm told that's the right pronunciation, in which all previous interpretations are questioned in the light of what can be perceived in the building itself, rather than what can be gleaned from other interpretations of it, um, or interpretations of those interpretations. So here again, we have the very delightful image of Bob persuading the custodians of Gloucester Cathedral, no doubt hearts in their mouths, and the Henry VII Chapel at Westminster Abbey to allow him to teeter about insurance-defying height um, in the vaulting. Um, the vault of the chapel, he tells us, more revealing than the dark side of the moon, one is inclined to move over it with some trepidation, aware that the stone panels are only three inches to four inches thick with a clear span of 35 feet. Standing on it induces a mixture of intellectual and physical elation as you look through one of the small apertures in its surface down to the chapel floor 60 feet below. Reading about its elation enough, um, you, feel, you feel limp with him. <laughs> Lastly, about the book, it's, it's humanity and the examples which impress, the feeling of the authorial voice which will survive, the civilized demolition job which will forever engage the quotidian homely examples and the elegant phrasing. And I'll quote a section which, um, in which he deals with two great philosophers, Immanuel Kant and Roger Scruton. I have used the term projective space. We also talk of visual space, motor tactile space, imaginary spaces, social space, painterly space, and architectural space. We sometimes talk about it as if it were plastic and pliable, sometimes as if rigid. Roger Scruton, in an effort to preserve the commonsensical aspect of Kant and demolish the pretensions of architectural theory, holds the proliferation of spaces to be the consequence of linguistic confusion. In each instance, we really mean a particular part of or partial apprehension of one great space. The locution architectural space is thus no more than an abbreviation of, quote, the portions of space inside buildings and the portions of space between buildings. Scruton maintains that the concept of space can be altogether eliminated from critical writing about architecture simply by using the word shape instead. 
But the substitution doesn't always work. And for the same reason, Luigi Moretti's solid plaster models of great architectural interior spaces do not always work either. The word space is as much about intimation as about surveyable dimensions. An intimation cannot be made of plaster, nor can it be described as a shape, nor can it easily be located as a portion of the one universal space. Right now, I'm looking out of my window. It's dark outside, and parts of my room, the illuminated drawing table, the open door near the light, and the light shade, hang suspended, apparently much enlarged, about halfway across the street, interlaced with a tree and pinioned by a lamp post. Do these familiar ghosts belong to the space of the room? And if so, how far does the room extend? Do they belong in the street? And if so, how many spaces are out there? Do they belong to both at once, or do they belong to neither? because contained within the reflective surface of the window. I have no trouble grasping the situation in each of these four alternative states, none of which correspond to Kant's view of the one and only one space. All that is happening here is that I am assuming space is dependent on matter, while Kant and Scruton assume it is not. This has nothing to do with theoretical physics. It's a question of how we choose to think of the experiences we have. I hope, we all hope, that this book will be going off to the publishers in a couple of months' time and to MIT, which is publishing it, and it will therefore come out next year sometime. I hope um, not too far into next year, but publishers usually seem to take about a year from getting things. Um, so that's the book. There is another, uh, there are further proposals which haven't developed yet, but they will when the book has been signed off, to do with a volume of selected essays. Um, so we will work on that later in the year. And I've been asked to tell you also about other commemorative events. There is going to be a non-denominational memorial service of remembrance at Harvard on October the 5th. And Harvard is also sponsoring a Robin Evel Evans Travelling Fellowship, which has been set up for students of the Graduate School of Design to allow students to go and look at a built phenomenon or a landscape, or a picture, to think about it, come back, and tell people what they've found. Um, there's one more housekeeping announcement which is slightly tangential before we move on to the thanks. Um, that is that Dan Evans was due to be playing here tonight with his band the Atomic Chainsaw Sex Vikings from Beyond Guildford. <laughs> Unfortunately, they will not be doing so, but um, their next big event is Lewisham Labour Club. Limes Grove, SE1, Saturday night, two quid, be there. <laughs> um, so finally, it's necessary to draw things to a um, draw things to a close. I hope that Bob would have found it a semi-interesting, or indeed an interesting, a wholly interesting day. I certainly have. I've also found it very moving. It's going to be um, quite a long time before we have anything approaching um, critical evaluation, as Kate Heron said earlier. But um, it's perfectly clear that we already have critical reception. Um, and the critical reception is wholly positive. And um, one again feels privileged to be part of that. So I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved in arranging today, without being specific about anybody. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who attended, and um, everybody, everybody who, who gave papers, whether they were illusory presences or here in reality, as well as in disembodied state. 
um, particularly those who travel a long way so to do. I'd also like to thank the sponsoring organizations, the Architectural Association, the Bartlett School of Architecture, and the University of Westminster. And lastly, we have to thank, which is no obligation, so it's not have to, we wish to thank Janet Evans. Um, Bob thanked her at the end of his acknowledgments to the fabrication of virtue, um, not just for typing, researching, reading, rereading, correcting, comments and suggestions, but for generosity and patience that bordered on the indulgent. All those who have been in any way connected with um, Bob in the last couple of months have been recipients of that indulgence, and we thank you very much.